Um, so today's panelists are all working with art and technology in these new and interesting ways. So what we're going to do is, uh, each of them is going to do a short presentation just explaining what they're doing. Uh, we'll have a little back and forth and then we'll have a discussion amongst all of us and then we'll open up the floor for questions. So if you want to be thinking in the back of your brain um, as we go. So let's start with you, Kevin Cunningham. Could you present some of the work you're doing at Three-Legged Dog in New York? Uh, I'm just going to show a couple of uh, short videos, two-minute uh, sort of reels. Uh, the first one's uh, focused mostly on our nonprofit work uh, and the second is mostly focused on our commission work which supports our nonprofit work. Um, 3LD is a creative production company. We're in our 20th year now. We use and run a 12,500 square foot flexible production studio uh, down in lower Manhattan below ground zero. We have about $3.5 million worth of equipment and we're dedicated to the creation of new ambitious experimental artwork of all kinds. Uh, and the most important resource we provide, as Robert uh, mentioned earlier, is time for artists to do their work. Uh, we're focused on uh, a ambitious work and we end up working with technology a lot. The space has also become a sort of talent magnet and we've developed a really strong international community of cutting edge artists. So one of the um, uh, things that when we think of digital code, which is a natural language, we think of it as sort of a universal translator between modes of expression and as um, uh, and so it innately engenders international collaboration. Our, our projects are almost all made up of multinational teams of artists and technicians. Part of that's being in New York, but part of it is just the nature of digital expression, right? Um, and we also have a, another program that we've started called 3LD 3D Plus, which attempts to um, look at these projects uh, at, from a cross-platform development uh, modality, right? So. Probably the most successful one is a film called Charlie Victor Romeo. This was a, 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 an experimental theater piece that was made in response to the horror uh, that was reality television in the early 90s, where the artist took um, transcripts from cockpit voice recordings of airline crashes and performed them in, an, in a 50-seat black box on Ludlow Street. So the second night, they looked out in the audience, and there were a bunch of guys with white shirts and ties on, and it turned out that the pilots had heard about this, so the artists started talking to the pilots in the bar across the street, and a relationship formed that went on for years. We just filmed it with NHK in 3D, and it ended up at Sundance and, was a, and went to many, many different festivals. Like all independent films, it hasn't made any money, but instead of 1,300 people who saw it in our theater, now almost a million and a half people have seen the project. So there's a there's a, a way to think about the use of digital technology that can bring especially the performing arts out to a larger audience that we're sort of focused on. I guess uh, we also have a history of creating technology um, and what happened that's begin in the 90s in 1997 we saw that the algorithms for uh, video and audio were getting more efficient and that computers were getting more um, efficient as well and uh, we needed a tool that didn't exist, which was a tool that could help us coordinate all the different aspects of a multimedia production, video, lighting, sound, audio, machines and devices. And, um, and we use those tools now. And actually, we, when people think of technology in the arts, they often think of big video or video mapping or VR or AR. But the real innovation, in my opinion anyway, for over the last 20 years has been in these tools that help artists do more with less. And so we do a lot of focus uh, on, on putting these tools in the hands of artists. And so this is some of our commercial work that we've done. I guess it's not really commercial. We don't accept any job, but we have clients, Michael Kors, Lady Gaga, um, you know, American Express. Uh, we've done the Metropolitan Museum of Art Gala twice now. Uh, this all happened at, after the recession, actually. We, uh, we lost 90% of our philanthropic support in 2009, overnight, basically. And we fell in, uh, into arrears with our landlord, the Metropolitan Transportation Authority. <laughs> and that got in the newspapers because we're one of the only arts organizations that were completely destroyed on 9-11. They kind of watch us. And the New York Times, uh, you know, uh, Oscar Eustace at the Public Theater saw the New York Times and Harold Coda at the Met saw the Wall Street Journal and they both called me and said, Hey Kev, we hear you're in trouble. We don't have any money, but we have these big multimedia productions we need somebody to do for us. So 
but there was five hundred thousand dollars you know and the met gala was great because you know mick jagger was there and trump was there and god was there and you know we we ended up getting a lot of phone calls after that and it turned into a, a business model and as robert also mentioned earlier a lot of people think of it as a new business model but really it's the same business model that michelangelo and rodin and many many artists over the centuries have used uh, to, to put their work together. And it's, it's ended up being a really um, uh, interesting, it's brought us uh, a deep, much deeper into China and Europe. It's, uh, it's brought uh, our ab ability in 2013 and 2014, we paid out a million dollars in each of those years to artists and fees and, and um, uh, commissions outside of what we paid them to work with us on the commercial work. So, that's as much as the Rockefeller or the, the MAP pro, uh, program and the creative co uh, capital give out to artists every year. So it's, you know, there's something there. It's not easy. It's the same as it has always been. The money is up and down with the market. It's basically we're working in the luxury market. But it also gives us an opportunity to do things that we wouldn't be able to do as a not for profit organization, like create one of the largest video projection surfaces ever built with 88 million pixels or land a full-size jet as a hologram on stage, you know, I mean, who wouldn't want to do that? <laughs> and so the judge is, you know, so um, uh, and the trick on that one, that's the Michael Kors project in Shanghai, they, we, we helped them launch their brand in China. Uh, on that uh, project is that that was all done by us with $350 software. So th this is the difference. We don't really buy into the proprietary model. We think that code is a natural language and, and uh, you know, really shouldn't be patented. Uh, but <laughs> we're also not rabid open sourcers, but, you know, but we, you know, we, we like to see artists, the artists who develop technology, and there are a lot of them who develop really good technology, benefit from their technology. So. So um, we work with, uh, we do a lot of training. We have a, a program that we do with the Builders Association. Uh, we're combining their storytelling for the 21st century for our with our design for the 21st century where we introduce artists to these affordable, very, very powerful tools. Um, and I guess that's kind of um, what happened to us when we were destroyed on 9-11 was we had an opportunity to step back and look at what we were doing. And we've been functioning as a not for profit funding, um, some government and private support, a lot of foundation support. And we looked at the criteria that a lot of the funders were using to judge us. And one of them was obviously sort of ridiculous. That was how many butts we put in the seats every year. If you do the math in New York, if you have 200 seats and you do anything beyond a four-hander, you know, with some lights, your box office doesn't really have very much impact. <laughs> you know, it does the laundry and pays a couple of design fees. So it's not a really a good reason to be doing things. So we decided kind of to focus, and we knew that funding was going to help. So we decided to focus on what we could do something about. We recovered about $45,000 for We spent a lot of that on a really nasty real estate lawyer. We so we were able to mitigate the cost of space in New York. And so far we've been able to bring about three and a half million dollars worth of equipment. And through our projects, Michael Kors, for example, donated a million and a half dollars worth of equipment after that production. We've been able to keep the equipment refreshed. And then the trick is to give the artists the time they need to do that work. So we created a flexible space, asked the architect a trick question. We asked him how we should wire our 21st century uh, you know, art and technology center. And only one of the 30 answered the question correctly, don't wire it, the wires might go away next year, <laughs> is the right answer to that question. Uh, and um, uh, we put the artists, we do our own work in there, and then we put the artists in uh, the spaces with 24-7 access to the space and equipment for two to six months at a time. And we also often do staged residencies, like Robert was talking about, where the artists come in for two, three weeks, four weeks, and then finally come in and do, you know, the whole thing. So. There's, I mean, there's a lot there, but um, uh, it's, a, it's a big topic. What we're finding is that digital technology is changing the way that artists make art and the way that audiences make art. We don't have the aging audience problem. We have an extremely diverse audience. We have about 80% average houses for the productions that we do. And they're, and they're diverse in terms of age, uh, class, uh, racial background, social background. 
Um, and we think it's because we're focusing on not just showing things, but on the way that technology is changing things. And the real, the real sort of shift that we see is towards what a lot of people are calling immersion, right? Which some people, to some people that means weird dinner theater. I, you know, I, to us it means putting the audience inside of the work instead of doing the work at them. And, and uh, there, there's a, it's, a, it's been profound, it's really been profound over the last few years, the relationship that's developed between uh, us and, and, and our artists and our audiences in the many, many, many different ways that this uh, trend uh, manifests itself. So, Kevin, do you think that this is a viable business model for other cultural institutions, and what does it take to make it happen? That's my question. <laughs> <laughs> Um, as far as I can tell, there is no viable business model for small, <laughs> mid-sized, independent arts. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it, I, I, my company runs, I've done, I've done technology startups, my company runs like a perpetually underfunded startup. That's, that's how it is. And, mm -hmm. and so we, we deal with things on a day-to-day -day basis and our biggest issue and our biggest focus is on cash flow. So one of, the, one of the things about that is that the, the, the sort of corporate framework that's promoted a lot of times in the, in the uh, in philanthropic community and also from government agencies is flat inappropriate um, for, not, for smaller nonprofits. They're, we're small businesses, right? We've gone back, actually, Three-Legged Dog's gone back to an old model, the artist-run organization. And that's how we run the place, and it has its problems. But um, the money goes where it needs to go, goes to the artwork, not to vendors or to unnecessary uh, bureau bureaucracy or management. Yeah. 